Welcome to the Exhorter Podcast, where we aim to stir up love and good works through bite-sized biblical discussion. Nate, this is your first uh, your first topic with us. Yeah. So uh, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Nate's in the lead chair. Oh boy. Hot seat. That's a very warm chair. Um, so I want to start with the passage from Hebrews chapter thirteen, verse five. It says, "Keep your life free." from the love of money and be content with what you have for he has said i will never leave you nor forsake you the reason that i wanted to start with that passage is because um, i feel like i have not always had a healthy relationship or a biblical uh, a biblically healthy relationship with money and i think it goes back to um just some things that happened when i was uh, a kid I, i grew up My dad was a flooring contractor and he got in a really, um, he had a really bad injury and he had to switch careers. And there was a time there when um, we were on government assistance and my parents went through bankruptcy. And I just remember money was always a problem. And so when I became an adult, I never wanted to go through or have my family go through those same challenges because it was, for me, it was so stressful. And so, especially as a young adult, I think that I had a fascination with money that was not biblically healthy. Um, So I am genuinely curious about your attitude towards money and how you guys developed your attitude towards money. Well, I'm excited for this conversation as well, because I'm the polar opposite of you, Nate. Um, I, as a kid and still kind of even to this day, it's, it's like the drunken sailor on shore leave with, with money in hand. I can't hold on to it because there's just stuff I got to buy all the time. And that that's been my problem is I've not been, I've not been mindful enough about budgeting and, and keeping track of things and planning things out in the future. So I think I've kind of the opposite problem as, as you. So I'm, I'm excited for this conversation. I think that every relationship, every marriage has one that is a little more tighter than the other and another one that just likes to spend. Uh, I think throughout my life, I, I've been, I wouldn't say a penny pincher, but I'm definitely someone who would uh, fill up the cart. And then by the time I got to the register, I felt guilty and I had to put everything back. For me, it's been, but I've, I've had both sides of it. Um, I found I can spend so much time focusing on e- on even being careful with money by, oh, I got to save so much money for retirement. I got to make sure I got this. I got to make sure I got that. Sometimes even making good choices about money can consume you to the point that I, I'm reminded of uh, the Israelites in the Old Testament, Kyle, our Wednesday night class. How many examples where, you know, we see God's chosen people making bad choices by counting on material things or or getting resources from an, another nation, not trusting in God that he's going to take care of. He's going to take care of it. You're going to get what you need. And so there's times uh, that I've maybe overthought things. And my wife will remind me when she told me that she was pregnant with Cole, uh, it, it wasn't that we weren't planning to have it. It was the timing because we at that time had a three bedroom, two bath house, no bedrooms. And, you know, money was tight. And she would tell you she was a single mom for a couple of weeks as I, re- as I tried to respond to, wait a minute. And I went totally all into, okay, we have to sell the house, buy another house. The market's taken. I mean, I went all into that mode and was consumed Call by- triage. Yeah, I was on a mission. <laughs> in nine months, we're going to be in a new house. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. But I was totally focused on that. And we joke about it now of not stopping and just enjoying the moment and realizing God's in control. This is amazing. He's going to take care of things physically. Uh, As a father and a husband, you're the leader. So, yes, you got to make good choices to make sure you're providing for your family. But don't let it consume you so much that you don't trust in God. So that's something I've had to work on I can work against you a little bit too though because I think I've had times over my lifetime where I've been very carefree about money not spending money I just wouldn't worry about being very responsible because God provides <laughs> like no matter what it was 
when we got down to our last dime, oh, look at a rebate check from something somewhere. And, and it, would, it would always be providential and it was always amazing. And I just, I think I leaned in a little bit too much to, well, God will figure it out. And that maybe didn't instill as a lot, a lot of confidence in my spouse um, and wasn't necessarily the responsible perspective to take, you know, godly in, in its right, but maybe not responsible as a leader. So um, I was just thinking, uh, Paul, what you were saying, it sounds like uh, you, you like to maybe keep tabs on the money and what's coming in and what's going out and, and where it's going. And uh, I have spreadsheets uh, with which I do this. And my wife will tell you that I have a, um, an addiction to spreadsheets. I guess part of it is because I want to keep the money and I want to grow uh, what we have. But another part of it is because I want to do what you guys are talking about and spend it. And there's things that I would like to spend it on. There's things that I would like to have. And when I read Hebrews thirteen five this morning, one of the things that stood out to me was it said, be content with what you have. And I feel like most of my adulthood, I have not been content with what I have. How do we build contentment with what we have? Sell it all away and don't have anything. That's yeah. You first. <laughs> you first, yeah. Well, I think about, you know, we always think about Jesus with the rich young ruler where, you know, the only time the Bible where I think that somebody actually had that choice and it's recorded for all history, his response. And we could, you know, it's easy to read and think, well, you know, you made the wrong choice. But it, you know, it, it's there for us to think about today when it comes to, to priorities, because it's not just the money we have, but also how generous are we with our own money, not just in, in giving to the Lord's work, but in uh, when we see a need. And again, trusting in God that we've got everything we need. In this country, we've accustomed ourselves to to a lifestyle that's at here, and and it's the American way of of growing our resources and becoming rich. Books about that, right? As far as how we can make ourselves better, and you want to be how's the, maybe your question? How's the balance between being a good steward of the money, being uh, trusting in the Lord, and somewhere in the middle there? You know how do, how do we get there? Well, your question, if I go back to, was how do you become content with what you have, Kyle? What would you say to that? That's Paul's way of saying, a, I'm not minutes. sure. <laughs> Give me a few minutes here, Kyle. Paul, you don't normally come out to volleyball, but that was a, uh, that was a set. Good job. <laughs> spike it. it. That was a ball. Spike it. Kyle can spike. Not this one. I was, when, I was gonna, when, you, when you first asked that question, I was going to say, that's a good question, Nate. Now let's have 20 minutes of contemplative silence. <laughs> oh, oh, good. I've stumped everybody. No, no, Our I, listeners will love that. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say one thing. Okay. When you're focused on the pursuit of money, it takes time. It takes resources. And if you're, if you're so focused on that and not on other things, time goes by. And I think as you get older and I'm approaching uh, my 50th year this year. So it's, I'm in that contemplative time looking back and my kids are at that phase of some, you know, more leaving the house. You, you're not going to go back and, and think say, I wish I would have spent more time focusing on that. You're going to say, I wish I would have spent more time focused on my family or focused on my faith. And I think that's one way that we can be content is really what's important to you. If you lost everything and you still had your faith and you still had your family, I think everybody here would say, I'd be okay. I would choose my family and my faith every time over money. And am I really showing that in, in my focus on money? But when it comes to contentment, I think that has to be focused on, on the Lord. And we need to understand the value of a relationship with our creator. We need to spend time contemplating in, in prayer, uh, meditation, through, through Bible study, through worship. Um, those are all key elements in helping us appreciate what we have in, in this relationship with our creator, having our sins washed away, a uh, completely blank slate. The price was paid, the, understanding the value of, of the precious blood of, of the son of God, uh, all, all those things. Uh, I think that has to be there for us to truly appreciate what we have with God. And only then can we start to put him first. And that's really the whole point of, I go to the minor prophets a lot because I taught through them recently, but that's the whole point of Haggai. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses 
and this temple lie in ruins. And he challenges them to think about how you work, but you don't bring much in. You sow much, but you reap very little. You put your money into a pocket that seems to have holes in it. And have you stopped to ask yourself why this is happening? Why things just aren't going your way? Maybe if you put me first, finish this temple, show some, show some priority uh, th- that I come first in your life and just see how that'll go for you. That passage has been so convicting for me at times when I've become um, more focused on money than serving God. I'm embarrassed to say that, but it's true. And that, that passage just stands out uh, as like, hey, look in the mirror, Nate. Um, you need to get to work for God, not for dollars. As you were talking, I thought of Psalm 37, 4. It says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And I think back to when I was a kid, I wanted a Ferrari. That was the desire of my heart, right? Someone explained this passage to me, and hopefully I can explain it decently. They said, it's not that God's going to give you necessarily whatever you want, but God will place within your heart the the desires uh, that he wants you to have. And that reminds me of, uh, I think it's in Romans 7 or 8, where it talks about uh, setting your mind on the things of above and not on the things of the earth. And Kyle, that goes back to what you said, that if we want to be content, then we need to dwell on the things of God, um, loving him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourself. And John, I liked what you said about, you know, spending money on going to lunch with brethren as opposed to, you know, I don't know, whatever else you might do with that money. Um, you know, that's that's something that when you said that, I thought, yeah, yeah. There have been times when we've said, no, uh, let's let's pass on on going to lunch and uh will, you know, put that money towards something else. And I think, boy, what really matters? Is it that, you know, thing I want to buy or is it that relationship I have with uh, my my brothers and sisters at church? I think, Nate, there's an illusion to that. If you do certain things, if you if you work hard and you do everything right, that you're going to save your money and, and that's something you can count on being there. There's a, a few hundred people in our own community who probably thought they were doing great because they were working for a company called Bitwise. And boy, things looked great. This was the, uh, you know, the company that was going to change Fresno. And now they have no job, no, no, you know, they're looking for a future. Uh, it can be gone like that. And so whenever we talk, look at the scriptures, it seems like it's always focused on that's not where riches are. And there's things that totally out of your control where you could lose everything. Um, you know, Paul says in uh, in First Timothy six, instructs those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Um, I've seen some people just devastated because they did everything right, and they still lost everything or lost you know, their fortune or their retirement, the market goes south and everything they thought was going to be there is gone. And they question even their value or their purpose in life because it's gone. So God gives us that advice. That's a great, great point, Paul. And kind of leads into another passage that I had, I think also from 1 Timothy 6. So if you go back to verse 10, Paul says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. I feel like I could relate to that very much because so many times when I've become consumed with money, I get so ridiculously stressed out. It is, ask my wife and she will tell you, oh yeah, he stresses about that. What does it mean to love money? You know, I was just reflecting on um, my last job switch. I spent the better part of 10 years in my last position, last job, uh, staying in a job that was, um, it worked me hard. It worked me long hours and it was at a startup company and it had the promise of a big payoff, a big nest egg at the end. 
And I remember thinking and talking about that job and the importance of spending the time and the effort putting into that basket for so many years as it will all be paid off because I'm doing this for my kids. I'm doing all this work. And uh, and when it was kind of threatened and I ended up leaving that job, I was frustrated and angry and, and not happy that uh, I had done all that work and not had anything to show for it. And that's right, Paul, it, it can all be taken away really fast, but also um, it's, a, it's a great lesson to learn that um, there's no guarantees. So I think to your question, what does it mean to love money? It, it means to sacrifice for it. It means to put it as a priority of all things. And even though in my mind, it was for a, a retirement or, you know, college funds and these good, wholesome things I wanted to do with this money and this payoff for my kids, um, I ended up robbing them of my time for a good amount of years, I think. And a focus. I mean, I'd be, be at Disneyland with the kids, you know, working, uh, looking on, in on a conference call with an earbud in my ear, uh, working until 2 or 3 a.m. in the hotel. Um, it was all consuming. And I think that when it comes to, you know, what is the love of money to me, it, it is, it's where you put your time, your effort, your focus, your sacrifice. And if, if I've been taught anything by God in all the jobs and all the years that I've had here on this earth, it's, um, there's always another one and there's always another, you know, opportunity to get money and, um, maybe the means in which I'm trying to live in, you know, are beyond the, the need and necessity here in this life. I have, I have a job to do here and maybe that's not the comfort that I'm supposed to have here, the house or the, the things that I'm supposed to have here to do that job. Which, which, which is why we need to diversify and invest in precious metals, which brings us to our sponsor, <laughs> sponsor for today's episode, gold. Oxford Gold Group. <laughs> no, I mean, I, 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 when you ask about loving money, I, I think this comes down to perspective. Very similar to our, our episode about being a, a better father, trying to remind yourself of the brevity, the, the, the brief window of time when your children are still children. I think keeping perspective is the helpful thing. And loving money is when you lose that perspective. You think about, um, and, and these are worthy, worthy goals. Uh, I want to have something to leave my children w- when I'm gone, or I, want, I don't want to be a burden to them when I'm older. I, w- I want to uh, be able to, to be cared for if, if, if I live long enough to the point where I need medical care or a nursing home or something. I want to be able to provide for that so I'm not burdened to my children. Those are all good goals and and worthy things of consideration and something that we could put effort towards. But do we want to lose that perspective where that becomes the thing we work for? Because it it all can be gone. You you could have the best plan and have it completely fall apart. So I I think it's important to keep that perspective. Is is that's a good thing to leave leave something for your children? But are are we spending all our time and effort and focus on leaving them money or resources or wealth instead of thinking eternally. I want to leave them something of eternal value. I I want those hours spent with my children, building that relationship, building that trust and instilling uh, lessons about God in in their early years. That's the thing I'm more concerned with. Uh, And besides, think about what the Bible teaches us. It's it's not too different from what Qui-Gon teaches a a, a very young Obi-Wan Kenobi. We must always be mindful of the future but not at the expense of the moment. Isn't that what we're taught in the Bible? When Jesus teaches us how to pray, it's give us this day our daily bread. I can be mindful of retirement and investing and things about the future, but Jesus emphasizes that, take satisfaction that today, in this moment, I'm glad I have a job. I, I'm not worried about giving food to my kids tonight. I'm not worried about whether they'll have a, a house to sleep in. And for that, I am grateful. And I'm concerned about the future, but I need to minimize that concern as much as I can because I understand uh, a, a billion years into eternity, I am not going to care one iota about how much money I had in the bank. So, Kyle, what you shared uh, br- brings me back to um, a question or a point that Paul made earlier in the episode where. He talked about, uh, he said, Nate, I think what you're trying to get at is where's the balance of, you know, being a good steward with money uh, versus uh, being too focused on on money. And it brings to mind uh, Matthew 6, 19 through 21, 
where Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So should I close my savings account? Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> should, should I empty my 401k and... I have a, a, a secondary account you can deposit. In. Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. No, but uh, how do we balance the good stewardship with, how do we do that and not focus too much on money? I, I can say without a definitive answer, but, but at the, at the outset, I can suggest the fact that you are concerned about this is a good start. And I think that's, that, that's at least a beginning point. If it's not a complete answer it is, if you aren't even thinking about, am I going overboard with this? Am I, then that should be a problem. If, if it doesn't even enter your mind that maybe I'm too focused on this, that's the red flag. So the, the passage you brought up earlier, Nate, in First Timothy chapter six, it's focusing on godliness and how that is what we should be focused on and, and what gain that is in our lives. But in that, it, it's really a, a contrast you know, it, it basically says godliness is actually means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. So you were asking about that earlier. You know, if, if you have that focus on God and you have that contentment, it goes on to talk about if you've got food and covering with these, we shall be content. So I think we've reset this expectation of, you know, we've got to be constantly going. And it, it, this to me is a tale of, of contrast. You know, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires, which plunge men into ruin and destruction. Um, the way I, I think about God as the, you know, the inspiration through Paul writing this, and I think of him looking at us as children saying, you're just hurting yourself. You know, he says later in verse 10 that you read, and pierce themselves with many griefs. Don't you realize you're just hurting yourself? And the image that somebody gave to me one time is, you're on the beach building a, a sandcastle and boy, you put all that time into it and it's amazing. But you know what? That ocean is coming and it is temporary. And you've got a, a massive, the real palace is behind you and you need to be focused on that palace that you're going to be in for all eternity. But I'm focused on this temporary sandcastle to make it as amazing as it can be in the time that I'm here. But while I'm doing it, those waves are coming in. and God's looking at us saying, don't overly focus on that. Be content in me. And I think that's the, that's the contrast he's painting here between these two, you know, two, not extremes, but rather where you should be compared to this over-focus on money. That's such a great analogy, Paul, sitting on the beach looking at your sandcastle and, you know, the mansion is right behind you and that's where you should be, should be focused. Can I tell one more story on that? You can. So there was a, this, this is a real story but it became a preacher story. There was a couple who was on their honeymoon and on their honeymoon, they, they went and they had, you know, they spent a lot of money on this honeymoon suite and didn't have a lot of money in general, but you know, for the honeymoon that they spent quite a bit and, and they were very excited and they got to the room and it was cramped. It was small. It was a huge letdown. And it was hot and they, they thought this is, I mean, it was not anything like what they expected. And they spent the whole night in this room and it just, it, it kind of took away from the whole thing because they had this idea of what it was going to be. And they went downstairs after to file it, to complain, to say, this is not what we paid for. Uh, and they only were there for one night. And so the uh, hotel manager came and was very apologetic and said, let me, you know, sh I, he was very confused because what they said didn't match what his expectation was of the room. So he went upstairs with them and it turns out actually this room was so amazing that it had an entry area that had beds and a couch too. But there was another set of doors that opened to the main room that was amazing. And they, they spent the night in this cramped, you know, entry room thinking it was the room and never made it to the real honeymoon suite. And by the way, the night, it's not like they can, the, the night's over. It was their own fault. It's not like they can blame the hotel. I think a lot of times that's, that's us, you know, we're, 
we're in here and we're focused in a, again on this temporary thing, not realizing that we've got, you know, the main course, the main honeymoon suite, if you will, uh, is there. Just focus on it and you're going to be content. Well, we're missing the point there. If you're more focused on the room, you're missing the point of a honeymoon. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> what is the point of a honeymoon, Kyle? Well, Nate, you bring up some good questions because in, in Bible times, especially New Testament times, the overwhelming majority of people were work a day, get paid for a day. I mean, you talk about paycheck to paycheck, that's literally day to day living. And when I think about what Jesus said about it's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, he's talking to people like us today that, that, have salaries and savings accounts and investments. And we are so far removed from the average, uh, the overwhelming majority of people that listen to Jesus when he was here in the flesh. And sometimes I look at that and just wonder, is it easier to be a Christian? Maybe if you don't have the savings and I'm not necessarily suggesting that just saying that the economics of today are so different that we have to ask these questions. But again, it's important that we're asking these questions and constantly reevaluating are my priorities in the right place? And maybe we would be better off as Christians if uh, everything just collapsed and we had to work a day to, to eat for that day. Reminds me of that show, the um, Life Be Low Zero series, but the one it's called Port Protection. It's up there in Alaska. And you watch some of these people just day to day, all their effort and all their work. They're in the most remote you know, area of uh, Alaska. And every day they are living like that. They're they're doing whatever it is to um, get firewood so they can eat and they can live. And I I love just sitting there watching some of those shows with my son. And in your air conditioned house, my air conditioned house, relaxing on the couch. Um, but you know, just reflecting on just the small little things and the the homesteader life and and what it must be to they must be you know very content and very happy with what they have and very excited for all the little comforts, you know, in life. And it, it, it's nice to think that way and kind of reset. And I remember thinking in my head, being like, wow, we need to become minimalist and sell half our stuff. And um, I think that working on actively not being materialistic and not being focused on those things is definitely a help to be in the right mindset. I think what I'm hearing overall is uh, what are you looking at? You know, if if you're looking at money, then that's what's going to grow in your heart and in your mind, and uh, and that's what you'll be focused on. And if you're looking at God and God's people and God's word, and um, and focusing on those things and using your money to serve those things, then that's what will grow in your mind and in your in your heart. It's interesting to me, Nate, when you look at the church in the world. The countries that are poorest is where churches are growing the fastest, and every stat shows that. So in America, uh, the churches are on decline. In Europe, they're, they've been on decline for a long time, uh, but you go to uh, almost every country in the African continent that, that has poverty, it's growing, you know, and, and we see that. So all of these, these areas that seem to not have anything else but to focus on the spiritual Yet here we're distracted and we're having a hard time getting people to pay attention because they're they're not focused on the spiritual things. So we're building those sandcastles. That's why fasting works, right? I mean, it's all about reducing the comforts and focusing, sacrificing that time or putting that time up to pray and to think about God and to reset your brain. We should do an episode about fasting. It would be quick. <laughs> <laughs> Let's fast from something for like a week and then we'll do it and see how I, like no phones or no so, coffee. So, oh, I don't know about that one. That would be a short That'd episode. Be a short episode. <laughs> but I like the idea of like, let's do this social experiment here around the table and let's fast something and see how it changed our mindset and all the things we were able to do. Yeah. But that's a future episode. Let's get back, <laughs> on. Let's get back on track. I just like the idea of it. So I've gotten a lot out of this uh, conversation that I need to go and think about and talk with my wife about um, because these are challenges that I I still struggle with even even now. So I'm kind of I just say on a positive note, I'm kind of well, I'm, I'm usually very critical of, of Gen Y, even though I'm kind of in that category. Well, technically, I am, you are. but I, I, I identify as Gen X. 
You can't do that. Yeah, Sorry, can. no, 85. It's um, 75 to 85 you can identify as the... But I will say one thing I appreciate about, do you call it Gen Wires? Gen, Generation Y? Uh, it is the van life trend. Yeah, it's a little trendy. But behind all of the, the Instagram fame that people are, are chasing after, I think there is something to appreciate about uh, living with less. And, you know, I, I'm not necessarily suggesting that. I, I couldn't imagine... Uh, taking my two kids and all the clothes that my wife insists they have in their closet uh, and living in a van. But, you know, the joke used to be if, if you don't straighten up and get good grades, you're going to end up living in a van down by the river. But now that's something people aspire to. And, you know, again, but behind all the trendiness of it, I do appreciate that at least there, there does seem to be a, 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 a swing in maybe moving to be a little bit less material driven. Yeah, I, we would have tiny housed it a while back if we didn't have kids. I mean, Taylor and I talked about that a lot. We you love can, the idea of the little tiny house. Tiny house it on my property and save yeah, some money. Yes, you build, um, you build five out there right now. Most okay. important thing I could say is just live below your means. Something I, I've not always been able to do, but if you can just live below your means, that's a good way of showing that you prioritize God first. It's saying I don't. I could do without this. I could do without this. I could have less of this. I could have less space, one less bedroom in the house. It, it, and that way I'm not stretched thin and stressed about money all the time. I, I could make this car last another year longer. Um, live below your means. Do it willingly. And I think you're going to see some reward and and take all the freed up mental space and direct it towards God. Well, Kyle, I'm glad to know my favorite motivational speaker was right about living in a van down by the river. Nate, thank you for this topic. Uh, I think it was good for us to to talk about this and think about it. I think your point was it's not focusing on money uh, in a way that's as a good steward, but rather the over-focus or this, this love of money that takes away from the real focus of God uh, that we talked about in 1 Timothy chapter 6. So thank you for joining uh, today's episode. Uh, we hope that you've gained from it. Uh, if you follow us on Facebook, please uh, share it, like it. it, helps us to know that you're listening. And if there's episodes that you would like to hear that we haven't been talking about, let us know. Send us a message, comment on Facebook. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for joining us today. You will like it. I like how you said that. I hope you gain from this episode, but not money. We, money. we don't hope that you gain <laughs> money. Ex- not your knowledge and experience and wisdom. Th- that kind of value. You know, John, you you can put your tiny house on, on my place too. Really? Yeah, a thousand bucks a month for I, I You know, honestly, I think I need to put... 900 bucks a month. That's what I say. I think I need to put one You're tiny house on much. each of the properties just so you guys don't fight. Um, but, you know... I get them I, on weekends. I don't want you coming in and out, man. You know, I think to, like, set us up, you know, we, we probably should have beforehand throw all the cards on the table and okay everyone say what your gross income is <laughs> no you don't want to do that? okay uh adjusted gross <laughs> adjusted gross. then say your expenses yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. Yeah, 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 more yeah, yeah, yeah. money yeah, yeah. more problems